we are going to go ahead and begin our session. So welcome. We're glad that you're here. Um, I am Jennifer Allen, and I am one of the co-directors of the Cherokee Rose Riding Project, which is housed in the College of Education at the University of West Georgia in Carrollton. Um, and we are excited to be here today and excited to be part of the Georgia Riding Project Sites Collaboration and glad to be here with a team presenting here at GCTE. Hello, my name is Bethany Scullin and I am also a co-director of the Cherokee Rose Writing Project at the University of West Georgia. I just moved here in August from Pennsylvania where I had been a part in actually of the Penn Lake National Writing Project in Erie, Pennsylvania with Penn State Barrand. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Clay Crawford. Um, I have taught for 17 years. I've taught every grade six through 12, and I am currently teaching sixth grade at Bay Springs Middle School in Villa Rica, Georgia. Uh, I met Jennifer and Stephen two years ago at the Cherokee Rose Summer Institute. And since then, uh, I've remained active in it uh, as a consultant, and I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you. My name is Stephen Littles, and I teach grade five in Douglasville at Eastside Elementary. Um, I also participated in Cherokee Rose two years ago, and I remain a participant now as a teacher consultant. So we're here today, watch my ex. We're here today to talk about reading like a writer. But in order to do that, we first have to understand what that means. As our students encounter text, they're always going to see techniques they can use to help them become better writers. So what I would like for us to do before we begin to talk about the information is to see if we can come up with some writing techniques we could help point out to our students as they read their text. If you don't say anything, I'm going to pick you. <laughs> like starting with a dependent clause, like set up and then point. OK, that's, that's great. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Anything else? What are some other things we can point out to our students that they can use in their writing that they can take from other writers of literature? Yes. Got it. Thank you. All right. That's a good start. Mr. Clay. All right. Reading like a writer is, is not a new concept. It's been around for, for quite a while, but it seems like uh, it's one of those things that kind of flies under the radar, and uh, we're hoping that we can draw a little attention to that today. Um, what I have, what we have up here on the board now, are are some experts in in the field. Um, these experts agree that mentor text should be used in our classrooms to model good writing, and that we should help children envision how they can utilize these crafts uh, in their own writing. Um, when we started thinking about this presentation, it reminded me of of when I had an on-campus job as an undergraduate student at West Georgia. Uh, I worked in the Department of Publications and Printing. And one thing that started to happen is as I worked there, uh, I began to notice all different types of paper. I would notice the weight of the paper, uh, what it's called, the texture, and it kind of reminded me or made me think this is kind of the same concept. Uh, Ralph Fletcher, I want to focus in on two of these experts and a couple of things that I found interesting about what they had to say. Um, Ralph Fletcher wrote a book called What a Writer Needs. If you have not read that, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great read. But he is relating an experience here of when he went into a second or third grade classroom and uh, one of the students commented on a book that he had written. And the little boy said, 
Uh, we read your book, Twilight Comes Twice, one boy told me. His eyes were shining. You got beautiful language in that book. But what was that boy trying to tell Mr. Fletcher? In his own way, this small boy was telling me, maybe I can't do it yet. Maybe I can't write like you do, but I can hear it. And if he can hear it, he can one day do it himself. Powerful books build roads inside our students, paths they will eventually travel to create their own writing. And again, that's from uh, what a writer needs. Another interesting concept uh, that I found was from Frank Smith. <clears throat> he compares the way that children learn to write with the way they learn spoken language. So I want to ask you a quick question. Uh, how do children learn spoken language? Do they sit in a class? Do they go through all these drills? Do we bombard them with rules? It just happens without them even knowing they're learning, without them being aware of what's going on. Um, when children listen like talkers, he calls this listening like a talker. When children listen like talkers, a, couple of, a few things happen. They're not aware that they're learning anything at all and they have a desire and an expectation to participate in that spoken language. They learn vicariously because they learn from what someone else does. They learn collaboratively because they learn through others helping them to achieve their own ends. When they listen, they are in collaboration with the speaker, even if they can't yet speak a word. Reading like a writer is the same concept. When we read, we're in collaboration with the author. Reading like a writer is like listening like a talker. It's the same thing as noticing paper like a printer. And it's the same concept as observing art like an artist or listening to music like a musician. Continuing briefly with uh, Frank Smith, uh, a couple of other things that stood out to me. Uh, to read like writers, children must see themselves as writers. Children will read stories, poems, and letters differently when they see these texts as things that they can produce themselves. And the last one there, but in order for them to see themselves as writers, they need collaboration from an interested practitioner. And who's that? That's us. We're that interested practitioner. So at this time, I'd like to turn over to Bethany and move into uh, a little example activity. Thank you. So we're going to take you through that process of reading like a writer. But first, before we do that, we want to share a book with you called Come On Rain. And it is a picture book. But I am a huge proponent of using picture books not only in elementary school, but in middle school and in high school. And more and more research is coming, to support, coming out to support that idea as well. Um, I hope you enjoy this. After we're done, we're going to start to pull apart pieces in it, looking for reading as a writer. But right now, we're just going to enjoy the, che enjoy, enjoy the text for the love of reading and enjoying it. All right. Oh, sorry, I need my glasses. All right. Come on rain, I say, squinting into the endless heat. Mama lists a listless vine in size, three weeks and not a drop. She says, sagging over her parched plants. The sound of a heavy truck rumbles past. Uneasy, Mama looks over to me. Is that thunder, Tessie, she asks. Mama hates thunder. I climb up the steps for a better look. It's just a truck, Mama, I say. I am, a si I am sizzling like a hot potato. I ask Mama, may I put on my bathing suit? Absolutely not, Mama says, frowning under her straw hat. You'll burn all day out in this sun. Up and down the block, cats pant. 
Heat wavers off tar patches in the broiling alleyway. Miss Gr Grace and Miss Vera bend, tending beds of drooping lupins. Not a sign of my friends, Liz or Rosemary. Not a peep from my pal, Jackie Joyce. I stare out over rooftops, past chimneys, into the way off distance, and that's when I see it coming, clouds rolling in, gray clouds bunched and bulging under a purple sky. A creeper of hope circles round my bones. Come on, rain, I whisper. Quietly, while Mama weeds, I cross the crackling dry path past Miss Glick's window. Glancing inside as I hurry by, Miss Glick needle sticks on her phonograph, playing the same note over and over in the dim, stuffy cave of her room. The smell of the hot tar and garbage bullies the air as I climb the steps to Jackie Joyce's porch. Jackie Joyce, I breathe, pressing my nose against her screen. Jackie Joyce comes to the door, her long legs like two brown string beans sprout from her shorts. It's going to rain, I whisper. Put on your suit and come, up, come straight over. Slick with sweat, I run back home and slip up past Mama. She is nearly senseless in the sizzling heat, kneeling over a hot rump of a melon. In the kitchen, I pour iced tea to the top of a tall glass. I aim a spoonful of sugar into my mouth, then a second into the drink. Got you some tea, Mama, I say, pulling her inside the house. Mama sinks into a kitchen chair and sweeps off her hat. Sweat trickles down her neck and wets the front of her dress and under her arms. Mama presses the ice-chilled glass against her skin. Aren't you something, Tessie, she says. I nod smartly. Rain's coming, Mama, I say. Mama turns to the window and sniffs. It's about time, she murmurs. Jackie Joyce in her bathing suit knocks at the door and I let her in. Jackie Joyce has her suit on, Mama, I say. May I, may I wear mine too? I hold my breath, waiting. A breeze blows the thin curtains and and then sucks them back against the screen again. Is there thunder, Mama asks. No thunder, I say. Is there lightning, Mama asks. No lightning, Jackie Joyce says. You stay where I can find you, Mama says. We will, I say. Go on then, Mama says, lifting the glass to her lips to take a sip. Come on, rain, I cheer, peeling out of my clothes and into my suit while Joyce runs to get Liz and Rosemary. We meet in the alleyway. All the insects have gone still. Trees sway under a swollen sky. The wind grows bolder and bolder. And just like that, rain comes. The fast drops plop down, making dust dance all around us. Then a deeper gray descends, and the air cools, and the clouds burst, and suddenly rain is everywhere. Come on, rain, we shout. It streams through our hair and down our backs. It freckles our feet, glazes our toes. We turn in circles, glistening in the rain's skin. Our mouths wide, we gulp down rain. Jackie Joyce chases Rosemary who chases Liz, who chases me. Wet sleeking our arms and legs, we splash up the block, squealing and whooping in the streaming rain. We make a racket. Miss Glick rushes out of her, on her porch. Miss Grace and Miss Vera are next, and then comes Mama. They run from their kitchens and skid to a stop. Leaning over their rails, they turn to each other. A smile spreads from porch to porch, and with a nod, First, then all. Fling off their shoes, skim off their hose, tossing streamers of stockings all over their shoulders. Our bare-legged mamas dance down the steps and join us in the fresh, clean rain, while the music from Miss Glick's phonograph shimmies and sparkles and streaks like night lightning. Jackie Joyce, Liz, Rosemary, and I, we grab the hands of our mamas. We twirl and sway them, tromping through puddles, romping and reeling in the moisty green air. We swing our wet and wild-haired mamas till we are all laughing under trinkets of silver rain. 
I hug Mama hard, and she hugs me back. The rain has made us new. As the clouds move off, I trace the drips of Mama's face. Everywhere, everyone, everything is misty limbs, springing back to life. We sure did get a soaking, Mama, I say. And we head home, purely soothed, fresh as dew, turning toward the first sweet rain is on. Okay, now we're gonna dig a little deeper into this text and begin reading like writers. On your, oh, nope, sorry. We're gonna pass out excerpts from this book we just read. And on your tables, in the center of your tables, is a chart. If you would all make sure you can see or get your hands on one of those charts that looks like this one. Okay, so um, Katie Wood Ray suggests a guided inquiry method for teaching students how to read like writers. Um, and this is uh, a modified form of the chart that she um, provides in her book, Wondrous Words. So um, let's take a look at the chart, and then we're going to delve into this, um, an excerpt from Come on Rain, and talk about how we can read like writers. So on the chart, the first thing that you're going to um, look for is what do you notice that the author is doing? So when we read like writers, we really need to make sure that we differentiate for our students that we're looking at how the text is written, not looking at the content or what the book is about. We, we're moving from there, enjoying the story as readers, and when we study them as writers, we're looking at how the text is written. So it's the what as readers and it's how as writers. So what do you notice that the author is doing? So how did the author say or write this idea? And then you look at the purpose. So why is the author doing this? Then, then you name it. So what can I call this crafting technique? And then what other text examples? So have I seen this craft used in another book? And then the final column is my writing. Have I used this craft before? Or how can I use this craft in my own writing? So getting students to think about envisioning how they might use this craft in their own writing. So if you'll look at the first page of the excerpt from Come on Rain, the one that starts slick with sweat. So I'm going to read that aloud to you. And I want you to read as writers looking at how this text is written and what stands out to you. Slick with sweat, I run back home and slip up the steps past Mama. She is nearly senseless in the sizzling, kneeling over the hot rump of a melon. So as I read this, I notice something. Something stands out to me as I'm reading this passage. And for me, what stands out is the s, the constant repetition of the s sound, which sounds like sizzling. Okay, so if I'm looking at my chart, then in the first column, I'm going to add, what do I notice that the author is doing? The author is using this repetition of the s sound at the beginnings of words. So then I'm going to think, why is the author doing this? So why do I think Karen Hess is wanting to repeat this s sound? And for me, in my mind, I think it's to draw attention to or call attention to that s sizzling, we think of, when we hear that s, we think of sizzle and hot, so the heat, so it's to focus our attention or draw our attention to the s, kind of the sizzle noise from the heat. Okay, so then I get to the name it column, and in the name it column, Katie Woodray says that you as a class, 
opportunity to name the craft as you see fit. So maybe if your students aren't ready yet for the technical term of what you would actually call this craft, you can collectively name this with your students, something that makes sense, sense collectively to all of you. Um, but we know that the repetition of the sound at the beginning of a word is called alliteration. So we can call this alliteration. And at that time, you can also introduce those higher level words. If you have younger students, you can introduce that to your students. So we're going to call it alliteration. And then other text examples. So have I ever seen another writer use this craft? So then you'll have a conversation with your students. Where, have, where else have you seen a writer repeating the beginning sounds of words? So for me, I, I know um, I've recently been reading a book to my daughter called Don't Take Your Snake for a Stroll. And all of those pages have alliterative animals and then something that follows. So I would add Don't Take Your Snake for a Stroll and then by Ireland. And so then in thinking about my writing, sometimes, sometimes we have to dig deep when we think about our own writing and ask our students to think about their writing. So I was reflecting on um, this particular craft of alliteration and I recently, um, my family moved from our old house now to a new house. And so when we moved, I wrote a letter to the new couple that had bought our house. It was called, If These Walls Could Talk. And so I used alliteration throughout my letter to bring attention to the rooms that I addressed in the houses and the things and memories that happened there. So I would put if these walls could talk. Now, what if you get to this my writing column and you and your students don't think of anything? So maybe if that column is blank and continues to be, maybe that gives you and your students something to think about or a goal to strive for in their next pieces of writing. Because your ultimate goal when reading like a writer is to get the students to understand how they can envision using this in their own writing. So in what ways or what pieces of writing can they maybe go back to and add some of these crafts that they're noticing. Okay, so let's look at the next, the next page. And we're gonna do a couple of these together and then we're gonna um, break up into small groups where you can have a chance to Read some other texts like writers. Okay, so the next page says, The smell of hot tar and garbage bullies the air as I climb the steps to Jackie Joyce's porch. Jackie Joyce, I breathe, pressing my nose against her screen. Jackie Joyce comes to the door. Her long legs, like two brown string beans, sprout from her shorts. It's going to rain, I whisper. Put on your suit and come straight over. Does anybody want to share what's something that you notice about how this text is written? What stands out to you, a craft technique? Okay, imagery. What, spe what specific, no, what specific um, things do you notice? Okay, so what do you notice that the author is doing? So the author is using descriptive language, or we could even say Sensory, so descriptive language, sensory details could go there. Now, um, she brought up another one, which would be our next, which could be a next um, column or the next row down with figurative language. But let's take descriptive language and sensory details through the, the rest of the chart, and then we'll move to figurative language. Okay, so what is the purpose of using descriptive language or sensory details? Yes, okay, so it, the reader can experience the story. Paints a picture in the reader's mind. Good. Okay, so we can name it. What would we name that if we were going to give it a technical term? We could say imagery. Word pictures. I like that. And again, the naming, as long as all, you and all of your students agree that this makes sense to you and that if you say word pictures when, you're, when you come across something in writing or if you say imagery, you all understand what that means. Okay, so other text examples. Do you have any other examples where you've seen this craft? You've seen writers using word pictures or imagery. Okay. Good. Um, 
borrow one of Beth's favorites and say the tale of Despero. Mm -hmm. Right there, and you can add it under the poetry one. Okay, and then let's think about my own writing. So think about your writing. Have you used this craft before? Yeah. Absolutely. You can absolutely do that. And what you would hope for would be that your students might say, oh, you know, we're reading Hatchet or whatever it might be. I noticed that Gary Paulson did that, you know, in this part of Hatchet or I could really imagine. Yes. And then as the more that you point this reading light writers out to your students, the more likely as you're reading and enjoying just as readers, they will start being able to kind of toggle back and forth between reading as a reader and reading like a writer and notice, noticing those things as they're reading. But yes, that would be a great idea. Do any of you have um, writing pieces where you know that you yourself have used word pictures or imagery? Okay. Poetry, personal poetry. Good. Okay, and we're going to go, let's, let's add... Um, Figurative language, because I know she mentioned the figurative language there. We wanna, you can add. We want to kind of be specific there. Yeah, we will when we get to. Mm -hmm. Are you, when you're doing figurative language, which specific line were you looking at? Okay. So she's comparing, so the author is comparing two things. Okay, comparing something possibly unfamiliar to something we can visualize. Okay? So why? Why would the author do that? Okay. So to create the mind movie, we can visualize what's in the story. All right. And then if we we're going to name it, we would call it figurative language, but more specifically... It would be a simile. Mm -hmm. Good. And then other text examples that you can think of. Can you think of a text or book that you've read that includes lots of figurative language? The House on Mango Street. And so you're free to, when you get to those books, if you have some of your own, you can add them there. And then think about your own writing and are there pieces of writing that you have used or that you've written that include figurative language or similes or maybe something you're working on that you could go back into and improve with some of that figurative language? Anybody have anything specific you want to shout out and add to the chart? No? Okay. So now we're going to break into small groups where we have some other texts that we can um, read like writers. And each one of us will come facilitate your tables. And don't be afraid. We might have the microphone coming around to capture some of our small group discussions. So um, if you'll move, we've got a 6-8 table and a 6-8 table there and a 3 through 5. And there's a K2 if we have any K2 people in the room. We can split off there. Yeah.
do that. Just look through them and I kind of explain to you why I pick pick these. Mm -hmm. So we take one of these. Yeah. Can we over or grab a uh, wheelchair? Or chair? No. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Not all. We can, we can include everybody. So let's let's just start by looking at what I have, and I just wanted to, to tell you why I picked each one. Uh, the first one on the blue paper, I just have some ex excerpts from Hatchet, and uh, from, by Gary Paulson, and I chose this one just simply because I picked sixth grade, and this is the text for um, for this first nine weeks now in sixth grade uh, on the state curriculum. And what I've done is I've taken just just a couple of excerpts. Again, you won't be able to read it all. Uh, you can kind of pick and choose what you want to read. I have a chapter one, an excerpt from chapter one when a pilot has a heart attack uh, while flying a plane. That could be, you can imagine how that might feel. Uh, chapter four, if you've ever uh, had some mosquito bites, uh, where, where do you read chapter four? This excerpt from chapter four when, he, when Brian gets attacked by the mosquitoes. Uh, a little short excerpt from chapter five uh, when he takes his first drink of water after waking up from being unconscious in the country. And chapter 15, uh, first me. Um, I don't know what it is about me. Uh, I like to read uh, when I'm reading. Uh, someone who's been hungry for a long time, that first meal, oh man. Okay, so that's sixth grade, uh, extended text. Here are some excerpts from my reading. But at the weedy shore, splash drip. Little lone spots, great bony legs, and a wide antler rack with weeds dripping down. Peep, peep. Where is Papa? <laughs> Little lone zigzags towards the rocks, but ruffles. Little lone spots, a great shaggy face, and a wide brown snout with a trout hanging out. Peep, peep. Where is Papa? Gliding smoother, a little like Papa. He swims as fast as he can until whack, whack, crash. <laughs> little Lone spots a great broad tail and wide front teeth with bark sprinkling down. Peep, 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 peep. Where is Papa? <laughs> then he hears, aha, uh -huh. Little Lone spins, Little Lone flaps. Little Loon backs away. Then Little Loon tries. He squeezes air out and tucks in his fluff. He wiggles his feet. He waggles his wings and plunk disappears from the side of the So I noticed right away that it's a story. It starts with a story. So, you know, she's yeah, and those aren't even sentences, but they're just written as sentences, and they all so it really starts they, with the, they, the narrative. To the yeah. Yeah. That right. They restate the like narrative that, that the story. shows right. us how she came up with they the idea. Okay. So, and then it, to me, it kind of weaves in and out of sort of the, the big picture and then ha her thought process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dialogue and rename quotes or and then or give detail. Quotes from her actual okay. submission. Because they kind of do give mm -hmm. new details, so right? The purpose. So integrating quotes. <coughs> We don't find out. I like how we don't find out to the end, but 
It wasn't. It, right. It, it wasn't a success. She kept the tattoo in the door. In the drawer. Or even, you know what? Is it kind of? Is it kind of parallel? So what? Well, an accident. A simple mistake. The last one. Did you find anything? These day to day things. Okay. Yeah. It was a simple mistake. Did you like the book? Well, I you know I haven't even thought about liking it. I was just trying. So what do we think we can collectively agree that we could call this putting verbs in all caps? Mm. Are all the words No. Either? No. What, the ones that are put in the caps, the verbs? Some of them are. So there's two, there's two different things going on. Yes, you brought up something with the capital letters. So we've got the onomatopoeia mm -hmm. words, which are the sound words. So we can add that in our next column. Okay. So yeah. good. Mm -hmm. um, but on this one, how do we want to call it? They're noticing that the verbs are in all caps. Um, I mean, capitalized all cap verbs or? All cap action words. Okay, good. All cap action Okay. Have you ever seen another writer use this craft? Okay. Are there any other books that you can think of at the middle school level that at the middle school level? Um, and what I know is, no. I can't. Mm -hmm. Not off the top of my head. Before you've been teaching me. Okay. No. <laughs> but now, you know, it may be that when you go back into your classroom and start reading some of those books, yeah. you might notice it, you know? Yeah. Um, how about your own writing? Have you ever used? All caps, emphasize verbs. I do on a regular, when I'm um, creating anchor charts and I'm writing sentences and, I, and it's something that I want to stand out. Emphasize? Mm -hmm. okay. I'll capitalize it. Anchor charts. I know um, sometimes people, before when I've done this with students, it wasn't necessarily action words, but it was it was words within a story that were capitalized, and the students called it. So their name for it was yelling on paper. That's what they called it. <laughs> and it's like that's a good way to describe the all caps. Stop yelling. <laughs> okay, so then the next row down. Sorry, that was really clever and good. I liked it. Um, another example. Um, that I've seen uh, another writer use this craft is in the giving tree where the tree is talking with the boy and she reveals herself and everything she says to him and her questions to him. Um, this might be a goal for me in my writing because I don't do a lot of um, fiction or you know like writing like narratives where I would be using that but it's so it's it was fun to read and interesting to read. Thank you. I know you're still working. Or well, you know? I, basically, I had said character development. That's really all, you know, you're just seeing. Yeah. I was looking for all those other little things, too, that we had done in this, but it just kept jumping back out. But, you know, but that's good. her purpose here was wherever developing her characters. That's good, right? Yeah. Right. So, so chapter five, and the girl, the woman, the sister was told. Okay. The girl, the pain is tough. Yeah, the, the pain is the brother. Now you have chapter six. Who's talking? Um, the great one, the girl. Right. Now Sister. that's what's wonderful about this book. Right? Um, the story is told, but they all chapters, but they're telling the same story from different perspectives. That's why I like it so much. Yeah. So what did you come up with? Dialogue, the same thing she had talked about in the book that I said was another example was the Magic Tree House where Annie and Jack they do dialogue like that. 
Um, now, but they don't go, they do come back and forth between the characters some with Annie and Jack. I know that I've personally read books in my life, like James Patterson books and different ones where they've had different characters' point of view, and as you change the chapter, the right. character changes. Right. Um, and the other one I was talking about was the character's point of view, really digging into the character and who they are. Okay. Now, this is my last task. And now we can look at chapter seven. Right? Okay. And I would like for us all to read that one together, if you don't mind. Okay. Like, out loud. Cool. If it's okay. Mm -hmm. Are you reading it out loud to the unicorn hunter? We're going to share. It should be 101. No hats for Yes. Yes. It was an accident, a simple mistake, a last minute effort to save time. They just toss it in and it will all work out sort of gesture that led to Ruth Wakefield's creation of the oh so delicious chocolate chip cookie. Uh, we're going to stop there. And so we said, well, it's a, a series of short sentences, and then we said some of them aren't really sentences, uh, that rename or give new details followed by a long, rambling, descriptive sentence. And we said the purpose was to rename, uh, to provide further detail, and for drama. And then we named it Rhythm, but we're open to other suggestions if you have another name for it. Anyone? No? And the other uh, text example that uh, came to my mind was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh my gosh, yeah. And uh, in our writing, we decided that we didn't have it, but we will try We will. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we both teach sixth grade, so we feel like this is something our sixth graders can model yes. very easily yes. and, and enjoy breaking the rules. They like it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Asked them if they want to see me draw a picture of a man, and uh, and yeah, and they did. So I drew a stick figure on the board, and then I showed them some pictures of Van Gogh, and started noticing the texture of the coat, and the texture of the man's face, and the different colors he uses. The jacket's not just blue; it's blue and black and gray to create texture. And he uses a paintbrush to do that. So. I started calling these simple sentences, these base sentences, stick figure sentences. And I said, let's make this stick figure sentence a, a Van Gogh. And at first they wanted to do that with every single sentence. But I said, no, you have to just kind of sprinkle it in like, you know, you wouldn't dump a whole carton of Morton salt on your french fries. You have to sprinkle it in and, and, and a little less is more. So that's, that's a technique that I see here. Participles is such a strong lesson when I was teaching seventh grade because it's so fast and easy and to the point to pull a mentor sentence up and immediately say, go try it and you're writing right now. Five minutes. And then we were also reading Hatchet at the same time and they would stop. So, oh, there's, one, there, he, there's some of those participles, participle things. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's some of the participle <laughs> things. Yeah. And, but as we used them in our writing, we started noticing them. And you'd be surprised how often the, those participles are used. And sometimes it might be a positive phrase like um, um, you know, licking its lips. Or, um, do we want to kind of focus in on one of these texts? Did anybody read the same thing, perhaps? Did anybody have a chance to look at the heart attack scene? If there's one in particular we want to, we want to look at. Other books that you may have seen these crafts in before. I know that um, 
Chris Van Allsburg. I don't know if you're familiar with Chris Van Allsburg, but he wrote um, Polar Express, Jumanji, the Garden of Abdul Hasazi. He uses a lot of hyphenated words in his, and he also uses the all cap, the all caps to draw attention to things. So I'm going to add Chris Van Allsburg to my hyphen column. <laughs> anybody, anybody that you can think of that uses the I used to Chris Van who? Chris Van Allsburg. So it's V A N. And then Allsburg, A L L S B U R G. And anything you can do with Chris Van Allsburg is great to see for both the storyline and the craft that he uses. Long, the long pause. Have y'all seen that in any? You know, you could even have a conversation with your students about what is another craft that writers do to signify long pause, and that would be the ellipses. A lot of times writers will use those instead to signify that wait period. Um, and again, if you are in your own classroom and you have access to your classroom library or the kids' books that they're reading, this column about other texts would be a lot easier to do. It's kind of harder to do when you're isolated from the classroom. And, Everything seems to <laughs> go out of your memory. And then their own writing, too, would be the same way. If they have access to their writer's notebooks and can pull out their own writing. And it may, again, it may not be that something they have already done, but maybe they could see how, oh, I could, in this, you know, in this basketball story, I could go back in and add on my via and capitalize you know, put it in all caps so it stands so out. Or, you know, in my poem about, about waiting on my sister to get ready for school, I could use long dashes when I wanted to stick my or you know, they had actually had access to their writing. Do you have any questions about your process? Having more likely to have them do it on the spot because I don't know that it's very difficult to get them to write and so they're not really they really haven't compiled as much in their writing journals and things as I wish they would mm -hmm. and or they, they don't have writing journals in their pieces of paper and they don't have them readily so for me it would work better to have them do it out can you try it out can you try it? And that's actually the way we did it when we did the mental sentences as opposed to mental, you know, take as opposed to the whole. Mm -hmm. So I, for me, I think it would work to have them try it out. And then as a step for those who are more organized, can you go back? Because we're kind of creating a, a memory. They don't really know they're creating, but I mean, they're exercises that when I tell them to do things, it's all geared towards ultimately them producing some form of a memoir because I've been to do things to like five styles of poetry and different things, but they're all about them. So, um, so I would say try it, you know, and in a sentence or two. Uh, that you can incorporate you know, later on into your piece, and then do you have anything that you think you could enrich or enhance by using this technique? Then, and, yes, yeah. Uh, if you if you've studied like say this book for instance and you pulled out all of those different things, maybe it's try one of these in your in your memoir poem or whatever you're working on. You know, you don't have to do all of them, but pick one or two that you think you can And then I would see the the thing about just telling them to just try it is that I don't think they can really get enough writing particularly when they're going to have to write for the test. So I would probably say try it, whether they have it or not, you know, try it now and then see whether or not you can, you know, make something better, you know, rather than, so that way they get two writings or two, you know, a writing and an enhancement. Yeah. And sometimes I think inspire writing. Right. Yes, I can pick it out, but can you use them for stylistic yeah. reasons when you create yeah. your own writing? And that's kind of so, what I was thinking of when you guys were introducing this. It was like, oh, yeah. Okay, we're doing a positive this week, so let's look for positives. Right. And and as you're reading, 
find one. Mm-hmm. Right. Kids have the books that they're reading, so mm-hmm. they should be able to find them. But I like that idea of the anchor chart, mm-hmm. yeah. add it on there, keep it going. Keep are it they going. doing a common reading, or are they each reading individually? Uh, we do both, but no, their their reading time every day is their selected reading. Okay. So different books, right. different authors, yeah. different genres. Yeah. So. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say when I, I when I've done this, uh, I've, I've seen, uh, we just uh, we just did it last week for my and my collab class. Uh, I found an example for them. I showed it to them. We talked about it. Discussed why the author did it. Similar to what you've done, I'm going to add these other pieces to it. But then I allowed them, uh, which is why I asked about the book, to take. I gave them four minutes to just flip through their book and see if they could identify one. And I kind of created it as an exit ticket to see who got it. Mm-hmm. And so that was my way of assessing. And then the next day I came back. And I showed a new example, and for my the ones who didn't get it, I copy down my example as their own, and then we created one as a class together to give them yet a second example, just to make sure that they could get it. So I, the, yeah, so it was good to use as an assessment. It was kind of fun, and they were really excited when they opened up their books because everyone had a book on their level, and I think they were really amazed that, oh, you know, I'm not reading 600 pages, but hey, my book has that too. Yeah. You know, so. That's very powerful. It is. To see it that is. too. And they're like, I can do this. I can, I can do this too. Too, so mm-hmm. yeah. Right. Did you before I have to go back up there? Did you when you were working with this chart? You mentioned something that you'd like to add to it, which I think would definitely enhance the use. Is there anything else that you noticed that should be changed or tweaked or you know? Because we actively use this actually in our undergrad mm-hmm. writing classes and do the same activity. So I was wondering, do you see it, should something be out or worded differently or added? Well, to what I just said, uh, for my students, something that I would do uh, for some of them is maybe add some options. It would do some pre-planning and and give them choices of what they would see because some of them may not be able to identify those things and just so that they if they won't it won't slow them down that they'll be able to continue and still feel that success maybe I would give them a couple of options do you think this is a simile do you think this is you know okay you know what I mean mm-hmm. so they have that little support there right that they can, I may add okay. that as a version or if they're using a writer's notebook, that could be a page in there that you've already given them, a yeah. whole list of right. choices. Mm-hmm. Go to your writer's notebook and look at your list of choices and mm-hmm. see if you can find any of those. And I, they'd always have that there as a resource. And I wonder if, um, under purpose, you know, while they're doing this, yeah. that sometimes, you know, my kids are like, oh, they... I wonder if we say, what does this make us do as readers? Oh. You might tell us why the author's what doing it. What does it make it. us do as yeah. readers? And then they have that's to the way we That's the way we approached when we read this. What was, right. it, doing? Yeah. What was it doing for us and as that's readers? that's really right. metacognition, mm-hmm. right. too. Yeah. Which is very high school. Good. You do. What grade do you teach? Eight. It's an N6. It's an N6. All kinds of genres like crafts. I know the crafts are easy. What concept might we teach with our students in that from that particular passage? Good, a lot. Metaphor, um, symbolism, the imagery, and the similar the imagery in that passage is so pretty. I think. Pretty in a way that rips out your soul. It, it is. It is. And, and to think that she was 14 or 15, and and I and I like to point that out to my students. You know, you guys are 11 and 12, and look where you are in your writing. She's only two years older than you. Like she's ahead, way ahead of me. You know, in my writing, and so it, and it goes to show that it has to be something that's inside. You know, something that's inside that you want to get out. Um, but yeah, I like I like the symbolism there, and the imagery. I think she said we had about a minute or two. Did anybody? That brings up a thought to me, though. Go just think about sure, it. go ahead. Yeah, Essie Hinton was 16 when she wrote The Outsiders. Exactly. You know, uh, that, that's almost a comparable text there in a sense. You know, I wonder how, how much of a contrast you could do with that. 
than what's common then between S.E. Hinton and Anne Frank. I mean, it's, it's something inside. Mm -hmm. It's something that's, that's hurting inside that has to, that has to come out. Um, I want to find one line here that, that sold me. I was, I was reading this. I bought it in a Charleston bookstore and was waiting for my appetizer to get here. <laughs> and I just opened the book and started reading. And I think, oh, I hope I didn't lose it. Sure. It's in the uh, third, second full paragraph on the back page. He says, um, again, this is, a lot of families just can't time and place and condition, like paper lace in a summer rain. Um, and this is one that's not appropriate, that would be more appropriate for high school, but uh, th this line kind of stood out to me. He says, it's talking about the community. Okay, we're going to come back together now and have a chance to let your group share out some of the crafts that you noticed as you were reading and working together. And Beth and Stephen are going to record those on our charts. So let's start. We'll start with our K2 group. K2 people, let's look over at the charts that we have started of writing crafts and don't fall Stephen. <laughs> um, do we have anything new K2 group here that we can add to the the charts with writing crafts on them? Anything that we found that's not there? Okay, repetition. We had hyphenated words. We also had all caps action words. Okay. What'd you say? Characterization. Characterization. Okay. What else from the three through five gallery? Parallelism. Good. Repetition also of some sort. Okay. Which I think we already have, but still worth noting. Anything else? Y'all good? Okay. Well, let's go to the six through eight table. What are some crafts? Adverbial phrases punctuated as sentences. And that's the one where you'll tell your students, you have to, a sentence has to be a full, it's got a subject and a predicate and a capital letter and a period, and they'll go, mmm, but this person is published and he or she didn't do that. <laughs> What else do y'all have? We had, we had a, a rhythm, rhythm as far as sentence structure goes. Okay, rhythm. Good. Anything else? Characterization again, okay. Structure, okay. 
Okay, plot structure, if you want to add that. And then you might even want to put some check marks beside characterization, like because they've been mentioned, and then repetition, maybe. Dialogue. Okay, good. Anything else from that group? Ooh, adding anecdotes. Okay, good. Personification, point of view. Okay, moving along to our last six through eight group. Okay. Do we have repetition? Did you? Okay. Fragments, intentional fragments. Good. Intentional run-ons, otherwise known as, I think Katie Wood Ray calls those taffy things or something, where they're long and stretched out. What else? Anything else? Metaphor. Metaphor. Symbolism and illusions. Anything else? Dialect. Dialect. A good one. I know we asked we asked you these at the beginning and we got three answers and now we have twenty. <laughs> okay, so as we wrap up our presentation, um can you share out what your aha moments about the process of reading like a writer? Like what grabbed you or what didn't you know before? Should I give the... share a sentence and they'll put it on the board and then they'll all copy the style with their own ideas and it's so immediate from their reading to their writing and I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I love that. So I'm stupid. May I add, may I add something yeah. to that? Um, I, I, like, I like what you said. Um, I, fa I find it difficult uh, as a teacher to try to find, w when I say mentor text, it's like I don't have time to read all of these things that I would like to read, and there's nothing wrong with doing uh, mentor text on a sentence level and just pulling out a sentence that just pops or a sentence that just has a, an effect or, or gives a, a feeling in, in your heart or just where a kid wants to go, wow, you know, how do you do that? Um, so I do that sometimes. I, if, if I find a sentence that I like, I'll just put it on the board. Just look at this sentence. That's, for no other reason than it sounds good or that it's cool. And uh, kids, and it's kind of like Ralph Fletcher earlier, they can hear it. And if they can hear it, then maybe, maybe they can do it. So don't be afraid to use uh, mentor sentences and have kids collect them. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great, you know, a great tool and it's quick and it's, and it's easy. My aha moment was when Clay told the story about working in a, a paper factory and you suddenly notice the different types of paper. You don't think about that as someone who generally doesn't work around different paper all the time. So extrapolating that to my classroom, all these different types of writing, different styles, once you are immersed in them, once you are able to say, I, I'm around enough of them, I can now, I can, I don't categorize them. I can bring words to them that I would not have had had I not been immersed in that situation. So that was, oh, okay. That was my aha moment. That was 25 yeah. years ago, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of going off what she said, these, once you start 
reading like this, you a lot of these books that we put out ha will have lists of books that you can pull these different crafts from. But once you start reading like this, you can find these in all your books, your classroom library, your regular library, books, articles that you already have. It's not like you have to go buy all these new things. You start to develop that eye for it and, oh, I remember it was in this. Oh, I know it's in that. And then move forward with that without spending a ton of money on mentor text, too. And she had a, an insight. Would you like to share what you said about the, the information on argument writing? Um, one thing that I noticed as we were working on uh, the reader, like writer, using our K-2 books is that I'm not a K-2 teacher. I teach seventh grade, but I just came over anyway. And... <laughs> Um, I was noticing that sometimes um, our students in 7th through 8th grade struggle in reading informational and argumentative um, writing pieces and just how we could reconstruct this to fit that form or style of writing uh, just to help them in that mode. Okay, the next one, what new insights did you gain about writing craft? Well, we're not the only models, like, they're all around us. <laughs> um, that we do have at our disposal, whether it be out of a textbook or different novels in our classroom or informational text, so many examples of modeling besides what we have to kind of come up with on our own. Um, in this type of right, we literally do have so many examples to show the kids in terms of craft and structure, um, which is a relief when we're always having to search and hunt down good, reliable text to use and examples, and we do have so many, so that's nice. And, and it's a relief as a writing teacher to know, I don't have to have all this material. I don't have to you know, be an expert writer in all these ways. I can just follow the mm -hmm. steps that I've myself. Exactly, exactly. Any other insights that you gained? Okay, so we have some now and later candy. And as we pass this out, I want you to think about this last question up here. What can you take that you learned now, today, from our presentation, and use later and implement in your classroom? So we're going to pass them out and think about what you learn now that you're going to implement or could possibly do later. Nobody wants the mic. That's what it is. I'm noticing. I can wrap on it. <laughs> different texts that I haven't seen before. I do yeah. use children's, I teach sixth and eighth grade and I do use children's books because they're so, you can use them in a short, for a mini lesson and the kids love it because it's nostalgic to them. Um, but I love this informational text here and the way this book is set up. It's very accessible but interesting and um, the other children's books that you shared. Oh, it's good. just beautiful pieces of writing and I haven't seen them before so. We were trying to do that, actually. <laughs> we had something new for That's you. That's good. Thank you. Oh. Uh, I just really appreciated the tool that we were given with the prompting questions because it really guided how I um, focused and thought through the text that I might not have thought of it. Um, as an author, you know, when it, just reading it, just to enjoy the story, you're thinking about things. And, but these prompting questions really help. So I appreciated that. And then also something um, in the beginning that you shared, the my writing part, 
when it was kind of like you asked, oh, ha have you used this craft before? And you were sharing, you know, that beautiful letter you wrote to the people who bought your house. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. But then mine was blank, right? <laughs> mine was blank. And she said, that's okay. That can be a goal for you. And I thought, oh, that's perfect goal setting, you know. As the kids have written through each of these or you have guided them through, that last box is, oh gosh, I need to use repetition or I need to use imagery or dialogue. And it becomes all those writing goals when you're conferring with your students or when you're seeing um, their writing, you know, as a class. And, you know, 90% of us don't have dialogue in our narrative stories. We, we, we have a good goal here. And, and this Judy Bloom one was just so beautiful with all the dialogue. Um, exposing the characters, you know, in such a creative way. So I, I took that away. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, kind of making a note about that chart, our group over here um, mentioned that you could use this as an anchor chart in the classroom. And then someone, at, or you added that you can also include the dialogue, that, not the dialogue, the actual text that is the example from the book on that chart, and then use the title and the page number so they can to it too if they want to. I thought that was a great idea. Like here's how it's actually, here it is right here and we can always refer to it. So I thought that was a good idea. We did put in the presenter folder um, on the GCTE site we have the presenters folder. We have the, the a blank version of that chart so you can utilize that and then um, we have the of the resource texts that are around on your tables and we can also include this presentation there as well. Uh, eventually, we're going to have the link to where you can find the recorded version of this presentation if you wanted to go back and view it. And there's um, our email addresses there if you need to reach out to us in any way. But we appreciate your attendance today, and thanks for your participation.